And I started uh, following some of the new preservation concepts and, uh, you know, led me to uh, Dr. Shakir and I uh, wanted to come see him and also Mike Nyack, who has really developed uh, the, the new advances and innovations in the deep neck. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three and we are doing live face-to-face -face interviews for a change. And I'm in Istanbul, and I have the pleasure of having Kapil Sagal with me. Yes. I'm ex yeah, I'm excited to meet you. I just uh, ran into you in the operating room, so I knew who you were right away. Yeah, it's so nice to, like, it's been such a long distance from, like, you're in, you're in Orlando, Florida, eh? Orlando, Florida, yeah. Yeah? So tell the listeners a little bit about your story. How did you end up being in Istanbul now? Yeah. What did you do in Orlando? I'm very interested to know. Yeah, uh, you know, short story. I tr I uh, grew up in Florida. I trained in uh, the Northeast, and uh, and I ended up uh, starting an aesthetic practice when I moved back to Florida about five six years ago. Um, as I developed it, that's when uh, you know COVID hit, and suddenly there's been this huge uh, growth in the uh, in rhinoplasty and facial plastic surgery, and I started uh, following some of the new preservation concepts, and uh, you know led me to. Uh, Dr. Shakir, and I uh, wanted to come see him, and also Mike Nyack, who has really developed uh, the the new advances and innovations in the deep neck. So I'm here to uh, see them, to do a cadaver dissection, learn from them, and uh, and uh, it, I suppose Istanbul is becoming the uh, the world capital right now for rhinoplasty. So uh, particularly for endonasal preservation concepts. So that's that's my goal. Yeah. But you didn't just come by yourself, right? Eh? No, I brought my whole family here, uh, my yeah. wife, uh, my, my three boys, we're all here. And I'm, awesome. I'm leaving here in a minute, as you know, to go uh, tour the city, uh, the beautiful fantastic. city. And Kapil, so you, you trained initially as an ENT or otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. So I, I trained in uh, ENT head and neck surgery uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and there we did almost exclusive the open, open rhinoplasty, yes. external uh, rhinoplasty technique. And then my fellowship in facial plastics, we did the endonasal technique. So I had exposure to both. Yeah. Um, and then in practice, I mainly due to, I felt at the time, uh, the quicker surgery, the quicker recovery, I, I sort of was drawn towards the endonasal technique. But, you know, up until four or five years ago, uh, it was rare to discuss the endonasal technique yes. by young surgeons, yeah. uh, particularly in, in meetings. Uh, and so... Uh, it's, it's now a resurgence where now suddenly it's, it's being talked about. People are excited to talk about yeah. it. And so, yeah, that's how I know. But it's also, I mean, one of the reasons why I invited you to come on the program, I, I really like being able to kind of identify how the young and upcoming guys are. You know, you, you mentioned this morning uh, in the OR that you, for 15 years you've been doing endonasal work and you got to meet Theo for the first time today and yet you have all his instruments. I have all his stuff. Yeah? Yeah. So I'm going to say maybe something a bit controversial, but possibly even 10 years ago, but at least 20 years ago, the United States was like the capital of facial plastics and rhinoplasty. It's controversial. And it seems yeah. to have changed a bit now. Is that true or not? Uh, well, listen, the, the, the American surgeons are amazing. We have uh, some of the, the world leaders, of course, but I think the innovations, the books, the new techniques, the new lectures yeah. are coming from all over the world, Brazil, yeah. South America, from from you know South Africa with yourself, and and uh, it seems like there's a lot of young people who are motivated, and I think we we should we should continue to expand on that in the U.S. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, I, I don't think for one second that that the I mean the godfathers of this are the American guys, but uh, it's also interesting to see for me, like say for example, a guy like Dean, who's been in the game so long, has suddenly now adapted to all of these new preservation techniques. Yeah, that's it's incredible to me to hear that a uh, someone who's been doing this for 20 years, or maybe in Dean's case, maybe even longer, uh, is willing to uh, change, to adapt their techniques and learn new techniques uh, at that stage of the game, which is a, which is a huge ask to, to change yeah. everything. But um, that being said, uh, I, I wonder if five years ago, if, if uh, an endonasal lecture was given at, uh, at a national meeting that it would be a very well attended lecture yeah, yeah. five years ago. And I think now that that's what's changed. Okay, let's, let's try and track a little bit about this topic we've been discussing. And talk to me a little bit about 
how you manage your practice and oh. your personal life at the same time because you must have a quite a busy practice. You've got these three busy boys as well. I how do you find yeah, balance in that? Likewise. Um, well, uh, my wife is also in medicine. She's also in, in surgical oncology. So it's a very busy practice. One thing that we've, we've started doing is uh, we really try to make, uh, I, I have now, after much discomfort, I changed my practice style to operate two days a week. And on Friday, I try to do a lot of administration. So, uh, you know, two full days of surgery and one day of, of academic. And then, of course, as, as you have as well, on the, on the weekends, we're doing sports with the kids yeah, and doing yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, but, uh, but I think managing a practice and running a, you know, a social media presence and, and YouTube channel, I'm sure yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah. your case is, is really uh, a lot of effort. That's non-clinical effort that you have to do at nights and weekends. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, I, one of the things I always say to the guys is you need to start how you want to finish because there's this misconception of saying I'm in private practice, I'm going to work as hard as I can. I'm going to see all my patients be available 24 seven down the line what happens you've, you've kind of lost yourself in that so to get that balance right it's not so easy eh? yeah i don't know if i'm the right person to ask but I, I i work at that every day i think i mean to be honest the first 10 years of practice you work on professional development and we're still here uh watching others and learning i mean that's part of uh growth but but i think um knowing how to develop a career is its own is its own specialty you know we don't know who knows the right amount to, to work you know yeah. But, uh, but it's only, only now that I'm starting to think that way. I think the last few years I was not, so. Okay, cool. So the last thing I wanted to chat to you about is like, yeah. we're off air, we were speaking about it and, and it's almost, we can kind of like record this now, is how do you see your role as it's evolving, getting to a place where you're actually starting to educate both patients and colleagues more about the skills that you've learned? Oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, I've never been one to uh, really speak at meetings, to be honest, up until this stage, I often uh, go and attend, I buy all the books and read, uh, yeah. but uh, as, as our practice has grown, as our national profile has grown, people know and they, they travel to see us. And I think, you know, I've entertained the possibility of even having a fellowship in my, uh, I think yeah. you have a fellow, isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, we've just started for the first yeah. time ever this year. It's so the first cool. fellow in, in Africa. So we in really- all of Africa, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, we're really happy about That's incredible. that. incredible. So That's it's a facial plastic surgery fellow. He's a plastic surgeon. And he's six months into it. He's coming to Verona to attend the meeting. And then, yeah, we'll get a new fellow next year. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that. But I do think that uh, people from, and I think I'm the same generation, but, but people who are maybe, say, 10 years into practice, we should be doing more uh, speaking at courses, writing. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should work on having our own small texts uh, that people yeah. can review because everybody's technique is valuable in its own yeah. way. So. Yeah. So last question. Yeah. So a guy who's a young guy who's listening to this and they, they want to set up and go into facial plastics and stuff, but there's this whole thing about resilience. You need to have resilience to continue your entire career. What would your advice be to a, a, possibly even a medical student and how amazing the speciality of facial plastic surgery is and you can give them a pearl of wisdom? Oh my gosh. Uh, I think uh, facial plastic surgery is, is the... It's, it's the queen of all the specialties because it has everything, right? It has complexity. It has, uh, you know, it's very glamorous in some ways, but, but it is a, a, a challenging thing to choose because uh, we have to stay humble. Every single surgery, uh, you know, you, you're met with new challenges. You have to find new ways to uh, not just have a good outcome and a good surgery, but also to make, make these patients happy. Yeah. So I think that is really, that is the crux of this surgery is being able to uh, not just deliver a, a result or an outcome, but also a good experience for the patients. And so now that, now that involves everything all the way to, to social media, to uh, managing uh, your phone calls, to, to the business and, you know, and make your office look this wonderful. So I, I, I don't know, it, it is a very challenging ask, but I think, uh, you know, anybody who's enterprising enough to, to do plastics or facial plastics certainly can run a business as well. It's, it is part of the process. I'm sure I've, I've seen, pictures and videos of your beautiful office down. And one day, I hope to see it one day, but I know you must have a lot, a lot of responsibility outside of this. So. Yeah, but that's what keeps yeah. us going. Keeps us going yeah. things. There's a couple from my side, I really, I mean, I, it's so exciting to kind of see a new kid on the block in a way. Um, yeah. What's, what I always think about it, they say it takes years to be an overnight success. That's true. You know, and you've put in years to get where you're at. That's and yeah, I really hope that it, you, you go from strength to strength. And I want to one day, 
be able to think back to this first time I ever recorded you on the podcast. Like, the first day we met. Guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll come down and see you one day, I hope. God willing. Awesome, so, yeah. man. Awesome. Yeah, thank cool. you for well, this. God bless and thank, thank you so you, much. Yeah. Thanks. Lovely. Guys, uh, make sure you come back again for another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast next week. Cheers.